Hello medicos good day to all of you this is dr bk for you and today i will be discussing about the temporomandibular joint and followed by that a short account on the boundaries and openings and communications of the terigo palatine fossa now our learning objectives for today will be with respect to the temporomandibular joint on a short introduction then the type of joint what type of joint is the temporomandibular joint then articulating surfaces superior and inferior articulating surfaces followed by that i will be discussing about the ligaments that is the capsule and the ligaments of the temporomandibular joint then the blood vessels and the nerves supplying the joint then the movements and the muscles producing such movements of the temporomandibular joint and finally i will be discussing about some clinical aspects <laughs> then i will give a brief account of the terigo palatine fossa okay now with this short introduction let us move on to the temporomandibular joint so it is the joint between your skull and the mandible or the lower jaw and it is the only movable joint with respect to the skull okay so these jaw movements are mainly responsible for our masticatory process for the mastication as well as for the speech now what type of joint it is actually a synovial joint because it is lined by a synovial membrane and you have synovial fluid in the joint cavity so that means it is a uh, pakka uh, joint okay then this head of the mandible is like a condyle okay so there are like condyles which actually fit into a fossa or a depression so again with respect to the variety it is condylar variety but here we call it as bicondylar because both the condyles move as one unit okay both the condyles they move as one unit because you cannot move uh, one joint alone the other example of condylar variety very good example is the knee joint okay but uh, knee joint what do you can do but here both the condyles move as what you read and that is why it is actually called as the bicondylar variety okay now the joint cavity is divided by a disc you have articular or intra articular disc into two compartments okay so whenever there is a disc intra articular disc that naturally what happens is it divides the joint cavity into two mainly to permit two types of movements you have an upper compartment and you have a lower compartment okay the intra articular disc and usually the intra articular disc is made up of fibrocartilage okay the intra articular disc is made up of fibrocartilage uh, in the joint also we have intra articular disc in the form of many sky but that does not completely divide the joint uh, to some extent it divides the joint cavity into an upper compartment and lower compartment and apart from that it also has some other functions with respect to knee joint but here the intra articular disc completely divides the joint cavity into two compartments now let us try to understand the articulating surfaces the superior articulating surface here you are able to see is mainly formed by the articular tubercle and only the anterior part of the articular fossa okay the articular tubercle and then the articular fossa anterior part of the articular fossa and the articular tubercle forms the superior articular surface the inferior articular surface is mainly formed 
by the cordyloid process or cordylar process of the mandible which is also considered as the head of the mandible now if you carefully look at the articular process inferior articular process it is compressed antero posteriorly so it is only uh, 10 mm whereas medio laterally transversely it is around 20 mm okay and the articular shape of the articular process is elliptical in shape okay it is compressed antero posteriorly and the shape of the articular process is elliptical in shape then if you look at the axis of this uh, head of the mandible which actually passes uh, center of axis of if you correct the center of axis of both the uh, heads of the mandible it passes through an arc of the circle okay if lies in the arc of a circle that passes through the anterior margin of the foramen magnum okay to correct the center points of the head of the mandible what happens is uh, it passes through the arc of a circle which passes through the anterior part of the foramen magnum then second word is the axis of the head of the mandible is almost right angles to the long axis of the mandible that is the ramus okay so that is what thing which you should uh, keep in mind with respect to the inferior articular surface then superior and inferior articular surface are actually covered by fibrocartilage so that is uh, what uh, peculiarity of this joint usually the articular surfaces are covered by the hyaline cartilage uh, the hyaline cartilage gives a smooth movement when both the bones when they come in contact with each other but here what happens is it is covered by fibrocartilage the cartilage of wear and tear uh, okay so usually hyaline cartilage has the uh, tendency to get calcified some some of the joints okay as age advances uh, might be to prevent that especially in the temporomandibular joint that this is a joint which is moved very extensively and that is why one of the reason it might be uh, covered with the fibrocartilage now coming to the ligaments of the joint so of the first ligament which we are going to discuss is the capsular ligament the capsular ligament encloses the joint completely uh, medially laterally and then also above and below okay it closes the joint completely and the attachments of the capsule are anteriorly it will be attached to the articular tubercle okay so anteriorly it will be attached to the articular tubercle and posteriorly it will be attached to the squamo tympanic fissure so here you are able to see this fissure so between the tympanic plate of temporal bone and the squamous part what you see is the squamo tympanic fissure the squamo tympanic fissure will be again divided by a downturned part of tegment tympani into petro squamous and petro tympanic fissure okay so that aspect i will come to later while we discuss with the cordata tympani nerve so so capsule what happens is i told you the attachments anteriorly it is attached to the articular tubercle above and also to the squamo tympanic fissure and front you are able to see uh, the tendon of the lateral pterygoid uh, merges with the capsule so it blends with the capsule and below it is attached the capsule is attached to the neck of the mandible so front and behind the neck of the mandible it is attached okay then what happens is apart from that the capsule is also attached to the periphery of the articular margins so around the articular fossa 
and also it here below it surrounds the deck of the mandible okay now if you look at the attachments above the capsule is loosely attached whereas below the capsule is very much tight okay and very intimately attached to the bone uh, this is because to permit certain movements because the lower uh, compartment of our joint the temporomandibular joint will move as one single unit okay so that is why the capsule is actually attached uh, very much intimately to the lower compartment now the interior of the capsule will be lined by the synovial membrane but the synovial membrane will not line the articular surfaces so anteriorly above articular tubercles cobo tympanic fissure below it is attached to the deck of the mandible are you able to understand and also it surrounds the articular margins the capsular attachment the interior of the capsule is lined by the synovial membrane but what happens is it does not line the articulating surfaces okay because if it lines the articulating surface then the synovial membrane will be damaged it might get torn during the various movements of the joint now coming to the articular disc this is actually the intra articular disc and the disc is actually made up of the fibrocartilage it divides the joint cavity into an above menisco temporal compartment and below the menisco mandibular compartment okay so the superior compartment is called as the menisco temporal compartment and the inferior compartment is called as the menisco mandibular compartment okay and that red color line is actually your lining of the synovial membrane you are able to see the synovial membrane does not extend into the articular area anterior part of the fossa and the tubercle here also the condyloid process and it does not even extend on to the articulating part of the disc above as well as the below now if you look at the uh, the articular disc it is actually attached to the inner part of the capsule okay so it is mainly attached to the inner part of the capsule and it is considered as the degenerated tendon of this lateral pterygoid muscle so original uh, insertion of the tendon of lateral pterygoid muscle should have been somewhere posteriorly okay so now this is considered as the degenerated tendon of the lateral pterygoid muscle above it is actually concave convex so you are able to see concave convex from before backwards whereas below it is uniformly concave below it is uniformly concave and above it is actually concave convex from the upper surface of the disc you look concave convex and below it is actually only concave then the apart from that the upper surface as i told you the posteriorly the disc splits into two lamina okay you are able to see that so posteriorly the disc splits into two lamina and between these two you have a venous plexus uh, intervening between this okay okay so the articular disc attaches to the margins uh, interior of the capsule and you are able to see it also shows five regions you see your anterior extension then anterior thick band then you see a intermediate zone then you see posterior thick band and posterior extension these are the five parts of the capsule okay anterior extension anterior thick band intermediate area posterior thick band and posterior extension now why actually and how actually this is developed i will uh, describe to you in the movement part while we discuss about the movements of the temporomandibular joint okay so that is the five parts as i told you uh, the disc represents now coming to the uh, other ligament so we have actually discussed about the capsule of the temporomandibular joint and the articular disc the next uh, ligament is actually the uh, lateral ligament or the temporomandibular ligament 
okay the lateral ligament or temporomandibular ligament it arises uh, mainly from the articular tubercle okay so it arises mainly from the articular tubercle of the zygoma bone and posterior margin of the lateral surface of the neck of the mandible okay posterior margin of the lateral surface of the neck of the mandible so that is the extension of the temporomandibular ligament so it mainly uh, prevents the posterior dislocation of the temporomandibular joint so it provides support by actually preventing the uh, the joint from uh, displacing or dislocating posteriorly the next ligament is the sphero-mandibular ligament okay so the sphero-mandibular ligament extends from the spine of sphenoid to the mandibular foramen there you have a bar of bone called as the lingula okay so from the spine of sphenoid to the lingula the sphero-mandibular uh, ligament is actually extending it is an accessory ligament because it does not provide any direct support to the temporomandibular joint and the ligament is also not stretched uh, during the opening or closing of the mouth that is during the elevation or depression what happens is the the ligament is not stretched and uh, this represents the remnant of the uh, Meckel's cartilage which is the cartilage of the first pharyngeal arch and the spiromandibular ligament is actually pierced by the bilohyoid vessels and nerves now originally if you trace the spiromandibular ligament it uh, extends beyond the spine of spheroid as the anterior ligament of malleus okay it extends beyond the spine of spheroid as the anterior ligament of malleus okay so that is about the lateral ligament and the spheromandibular ligament the next uh, ligament which we are going to discuss is about the stylomandibular ligament this is also an accessory ligament stylomandibular ligament it is a modification of the investing layer of deep cervical fascia okay modification of the investing layer of deep cervical fascia which extends from the styloid process to the angle of mandible okay this actually separates the parotid gland from the submandibular salivary gland now coming to the relations of the mandible so laterally it is subcutaneous you can easily in front of the tragus you just place your finger and open and close your mouth you can see the uh, condyloid process moving so laterally what happens is the mandible is uh, the temporomandibular joint is subcutaneous okay anteriorly it is related to your lateral pterygoid muscle and your temporalis temporalis fan shaped muscle which is inserting into the coronoid process okay so anteriorly the joint is related to the temporalis and also to the lateral pterygoid muscle then here in the mandibular notch the basitric vessels and nerves okay so they all form the anterior relations okay posterior uh, or the medial relations first we will see so medially so these are all it is related to the auriculotemporal nerve so this is the medial aspect of the joint auriculotemporal nerve middle meningeal artery spinomandibular ligament auriculotemporal nerve middle meningeal artery which is entering to the foramen spinosum and that is your uh, spinomandibular uh, ligament these are all forms and of course the medial pterygoid to some extent also forms the uh, medial relations so that is the medial relations behind it will be related to the external acoustic meatus and parotid gland okay so behind the joint it is related to the external acoustic meatus and bounded to this is the uh, parotid gland okay <coughs> that is posteriorly and in front as i told you basitric vessels and lateral pterygoid temporalis muscle forms the anterior relations of the joint so these are all the ligaments and the relations of the temporomandibular joint so next uh, 
the blood supply of the joint uh, mainly it is supplied by the superficial temporal vessels okay which is actually a branch or the uh, one of the terminal branch of the external carotid artery which is ascending no? so and also the maxillary artery will give some uh, branches to the temporomandibular joint okay the next uh, the art nerve supply is mainly by the basitric nerve and the auriculotemporal nerve okay the basitric nerve which is emerging from the uh, basitric notch anterior division of the mandibular nerve what happens uh, as it enters to the mandibular notch to supply the deep aspect of the basseter muscle it gives articular twig to the temporomandibular joint and uh, one more nerve which is supplying is the auriculotemporal nerve so the auriculotemporal nerve as it passes very intimately to the neck of the mandible it also gives a branch to the temporomandibular joint okay so it is nothing but the hilton slough the nerve passing to the joint also supplies the skin and muscle over the joint so now we will actually come to the uh, movements of the temporomandibular joint so the permitted movements in the temporomandibular joint are mainly protrusion retraction okay then followed by that you have the elevation and then the depression so elevation and depression you all know that it is actually elevation the when the mandible moves downwards as in opening the mouth then protrusion uh, sorry uh, de depression is while opening the mouth and, pro and uh, elevation is while closing the mouth okay so protrusion retraction elevation and uh, depression then you have side to side movement okay so during the grinding process or chewing process you have the side to side movement now elevation and depression takes place around a transverse axis okay so which passes through the uh, neck of the mandible okay the lower part of the head of the neck of the mandible transverse uh, axis and usually around the transverse axis it permits the gliding movements so around the transverse axis what happens is it permits the uh, gliding movements okay now this transverse axis as i told you permits only the gliding movements uh, which is like a hinge movement okay only one axis it can move elevation depression elevation and depression but if you look carefully during the elevation and depression even though it is a transverse axis the axis keeps on shifting because uh, that is called as the evolute of profile because uh, what is it mean by evolute of profile is this uh, condyloid process of the mandible accommodates the arcs of a numerous circle so numerous circles if you draw and then connect these by the arcs of a numerous circle then the axis of hinge will keep on shifting as the mandible moves downwards in opening the mouth and again in the reverse it again keeps on shifting backwards that is the hinge axis no uh, <coughs> the transverse axis will pass through a numerous arcs of a circle and it keeps on shifting with respect to the rotary movements that is the side to side movements the axis is vertical so around the vertical axis the mandibular head will move in case of the rotary movements which usually takes place in the lower compartment of the joint now during all movements elevation depression protrusion and uh, retraction what happens is the movement takes place in both the compartments it is not a, uh, only in one compartment the movement is taking place okay so side to side movement is vertical axis and elevation and depression is transverse axis and i told you the upper medisco temporal compartment permits the uh, gliding movement so the disc along with the head of the mandible will glide forwards and backwards the upper compartment whereas the lower compartment the head of the mandible alone what happens it rotates the lower medisco mandibular compartment now let us try to understand the movements of the temporomandibular joint so the first movement what we have seen is the 
protrusion so protrusion is actually when the mandible advances forwards so the lower jaw uh, row of teeth along with the mandible will project forwards and the maximum range is around 10 mm so that is 1 cm the maximum range is uh, 10 mm or 1 cm and protraction takes place uh, in the occlusal position of the joint so I will come to occlusal position of the joint after a couple of slides now this protrusion is mainly brought about by the simultaneous contraction of the lateral and medial pterygoids of both the sides both the lateral and medial pterygoid when they contract simultaneously they bring about protrusion the next uh, uh, action is the retraction which is the reverse of the protrusion now this is mainly brought about by the posterior fibers of the temporalis muscle which bring back the mandible to its uh, resting position okay so that is actually called as the retraction now forceful retraction is assisted by the digastric and the geniohyoid muscles also okay so forceful retraction uh, is assisted along with the temporalis uh, the uh, the digastric muscles and the geniohyoid muscles they assist in the forceful retraction so here it's a very simple uh, diagram uh, which you can see the various movements bringing brought about by the various muscles this is your masseter muscle this is your temporalis muscle and this is your lateral pterygoid muscle and this is your medial pterygoid muscle so the up arrow means it is elevation down arrow is actually depression then this is protraction and this is retraction now temporalis assists in retraction as well as elevation okay so that is the action of temporalis now if you look at the masseter it helps in mainly elevation as well as protraction okay when you look at the lateral pterygoid protraction and depression when you look at the medial pterygoid uh, protraction and actually elevation okay so it's a very simple diagram you will be able to understand the movements the various muscles uh, producing the muscles producing the various movements of the joint uh, can be easily remembered with the help of this diagram now we will move on to the uh, next movement that is called as the depression or opening the mouth now the opening the mouth is actually mainly brought about by the lateral pterygoid muscle the contraction of the lateral pterygoid muscle and it is assisted by the gravity but it is not as simple as we think it occurs mainly in three phases okay so the three phases are uh, so here you are able to see the movement which is taking place the first phase what happens is the head rolls the gliding movement uh, sorry the rotary movement takes place okay then followed by that what happens is followed by the rotary movement you can see a gliding takes place okay followed by the rotary movement what happens is the gliding movement takes place in the second phase i told you a gliding movement and in the third phase the head rotates further okay the head rotates uh, further during the gliding movement okay so here you are able to see that first a rotary then followed by a, a gliding movement first rotary and then gliding and then rotation and you look carefully the head along with the disc is actually uh, moving with as a single unit the lower compartment okay now first what happens is rotary takes place then the gliding takes place further gliding is actually prevented by the uh, tension of the temporalis muscle because it is actually a retractor no it has an opposite action so it prevents the further uh, downward movement then because the second both because the gliding is arrested there then what happens is the third phase the rotation takes place okay 
first forward gliding is mainly by the uh, your lateral pterygoid muscle okay then what happens is the final rotation or opening of the mouth is assisted by the pull of the uh, digastric and the the digastric and the geniohyoid muscles for this the hyoid will be stabilized by the infrahyoid muscles okay now i told you gliding rotary sorry rotary gliding and rotary so first phase a gliding takes place and there the movement is stopped then the rotary takes place sorry first the rotary takes place the movement is stopped then gliding takes place and then a rotation takes place so because of these three phases only you see the articular disc has got the three bands no? so anterior extension anterior band and posterior band the thickening anterior and posterior band is the place the between these two the gliding part takes place movement beyond that it is rotary below behind and also in the front okay so that is about the uh, depression of the temporomandibular joint okay so muscles as i told you lateral pterygoid which brings about the forward gliding and it is arrested by the temporalis and further downward rotation in the final phase is actually by the geniohyoid and digastric muscle now next uh, movement which we are going to discuss is about the elevation so elevation is actually the reverse of so that is the uh, reverse of the depression okay that is how you are able to see the gliding and rotation takes place so reverse of depression which is mainly produced by the masseter temporalis and the medial pterygoid because elevation is closing the mouth elevation is actually uh, closing the mouth and it is acting against the gravity so because of that these muscles are very powerful and they produce impressions uh, over the uh, mandible where they are getting inserted side to side movement is alternative contraction of the medial pterygoid and the lateral pterygoid okay so side to side movement is actually the alternate contraction of the medial pterygoid and lateral pterygoid so medial pterygoid what happens of one side contracts then lateral pterygoid of opposite side now what happens in the side to side movement is first the mandible of one side glides and rotates and move back to its original position then the mandible of the other side can rotate okay so that is uh, what is taking place in the both the joints with respect to the side to side chewing movements okay so these are all the uh, movements of the temporo mandibular joint that is your protrusion retraction elevation depression and side to side movement okay so next uh, coming to the joint position i described that uh, the protrusion takes place in the occlusal position of the joint so whenever you just uh, normally close your mouth there is a 3 to 4 mm gap 3 to 4 mm gap between the upper and lower row of teeth this is actually called as the resting position normally when we close our mouth but in occlusal position what happens is this gap is completely reduced they are in close contact and only in the occlusal position the protrusion can take place okay and this occlusal position is considered as the most stable position of the joint so what are the factors maintaining the uh, stability of the joint what is dislocation is prevented by the articular tubercle dislocation will be prevented by the articular tubercle anteriorly posteriorly you can see the lateral ligament preventing the posterior dislocation then during protraction too much of a protraction or gliding forward is prevented by the temporalis muscle same way during retraction the excess retraction is uh, checked by the lateral pterygoid muscle the lateral pterygoid exerts a check so it exerts a pull when the mandible is actually uh, retracted too much okay so that is about the resting position and the uh, occlusal position of the joint now even though the range of elevation and depression is 50 mm actually it is only uh, around 40 mm or 4 cm okay so 
what happens of this 40 mm uh, 25 and uh, 25 and 15 mm you can uh, divide okay gliding takes place for the first uh, 25 millimeter and then the rotary takes place for the remaining so coming to the clinical aspects the most uh, commonly displaced uh, mandible displaces anteriorly or anterior dislocation now when actually this takes place is during the depression or opening of the mouth if uh, the lateral pterygoid goes into spasm when you open your mouth too much acid yawning then what happens is you are able to see the head of the mandible has come anterior to the articular tubercle so it is displaced and it is uh, displaced anteriorly so undue stretching of the lateral pterygoid acid yawning so that lateral pterygoid what happens is goes into spasm and not only that the masseter will get stretched too much and uh, that leads to the jaw getting locked in that position and you can see the teeth will get a ball aligned so one side unilateral if it is one side uh, the lower jaw will be moved to one side uh, actually disturbing the symmetry of your face sometimes bilateral dislocation is also possible now how actually reduction is taking place the traditional method is actually by pushing the mandible uh, downwards and then upwards okay so by pushing the mandible first uh, downwards and then downwards and then you push it upwards so there is a thumb of both hands you keep it on the uh, bolars okay and then around the inferior other uh, figure you keep it over the angle of the mandible and you just make it posteriorly okay and push it backwards and then upwards the other method is actually when you do it on the affected side in the extra oral so one thumb of the coronoid process a direct pressure is given posteriorly it will push it backwards okay so these are two methods by which you can uh, this one reduce the dislocation of the temporomandibular joint now fractures of the mandible might also produce ball alignment so one side of the teeth or row of the teeth will not completely align with the upper row of teeth so the anterior fragment might be displaced downwards and backwards whereas the posterior fragment above and forwards okay so when there is a ball alignment of the teeth you should also suspect for fracture of mandible uh, rather than the dislocation of the temporomandibular joint so with this i have actually completed the uh, temporomandibular joint so the articulating surfaces ligaments various movements muscles producing the movements and the clinical aspects now i will pass on to the pterygopalatine fossa so it is actually a pyramidal shaped space but the pyramid is actually inverted with the apex facing downwards and the base is actually upwards okay and it is mainly present between the pterygoid bone below uh, behind you can see the pterygoid bone and in front the palate okay so that is why it is called as the pterygopalatine fossa boundaries anteriorly it is by the posterior surface of the body of the maxilla so in front it is the posterior surface of the body of the maxilla and behind the root of the pterygoid process okay from which the lateral pterygoid and the medial pterygoid plate no? the root of the pterygoid process and the anterior surface of the greater wing of spheroid this is actually your uh, infratemporal surface of greater wing of spheroid you are able to see so the anterior surface of greater wing of spheroid you see more deeply that is the boundary of the behind posterior boundary of the infratemporal fossa so in the posterior wall from medial to lateral you come across three openings so that is the posterior wall medial to lateral you come across three openings what is actually your foramen uh, rotundum okay so that connects the middle cranial fossa with the pterygopalatine fossa foramen rotundum 
which you see on the middle cranial fossa, floor of the middle uh, cranial fossa, what happens? It communicates with the pterygopalatine fossa, the maxillary nerve. The maxillary nerve actually passes through this. The next opening, you see the anterior opening of the pterygoid canal. Okay, so the pterygoid canal, you see extending one end is in the opening into the posterior wall of the uh, pterygopalatine fossa. The other end you can see near the foramen lazirum, anterior margin of the foramen lazirum. So this will transmit your uh, artery and uh, nerve of the pterygoid canal. Artery of pterygoid canal will again a branch of maxillary artery and nerve of pterygoid canal is a combination of two nerves. It is actually the greater petrosal nerve and the uh, deep petrosal nerve. Okay. So they carry pre-ganglionic sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers to a ganglion which is present in this fossa. That is the pterygopalatine ganglion. So three openings. What is foramen rotundum? Then the other one is opening of pterygoid canal. And other one is the palatovaginal canal which communicates the pterygopalatine fossa with the pharynx. Okay. So roof of the fossa. So medially it is made the body of spheroid and orbital plate of frontal bone. Okay. Some books also describe the perpendicular plate of uh, palatine also comes floor is narrow due to the approximation of the anterior and the posterior wall. So in the upper part of the roof you see the uh, the inferior orbital fissure which will again transmit the infraorbital nerve and that emerges out through the infraorbital foramen. Inferior orbital fissure, the upper part of the roof. Floor, here you can see one canal, the greater palatine foramen and the canal through which the it will communicate with the oral cavity. Greater palatine canal connects with the oral cavity. Okay? That is about the floor. Laterally, this opening you see is the pterygomaxillary fissure through which it communicates with the infratemporal fossa. Pterygomaxillary fissure, it communicates with the infratemporal fossa. Okay. Medially, the medial most opening you are seeing inside that is the sphenopalatine foramen through which it will communicate with the nasal cavity. Through which it will communicate with the nasal cavity. So, communications again so this is actually the infra pterygopalatine fossa you are able to see the pterygopalatine fossa from the posterior wall as i told you what is actually the pterygoid canal other one is the foramen rotundum and other one is the palatovaginal canal so these three, through which it will communicate, foramen rotundum with the middle cranial fossa, palatovaginal canal, it will communicate with the pharynx, and pterygoid canal with the foramen uh, lazirum. Okay, so that is the palatovaginal canal, and that is your pterygoid canal, and uh, this should be your foramen rotundum. The next, uh, from the posterior wall, from the medial wall, Sphenopalatine uh, foramen through which the sphenopalatine nerve or the nasopalatine nerve passes. Okay. Through the nasal cavity. It communicates with the nasal cavity. Then from the floor, greater palatine uh, canal or foramen through which it transmits the greater palatine vessels and nerves. From the lateral wall, pterygomaxillary fissure through which it communicates with the infratemporal fossa. The third part of maxillary artery will actually pass through the pterygomaxillary fissure. Then from the roof, infraorbital fissure, it communicates with the orbit. So totally there are seven communications. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven communications of the pterygopalatine fossa. The why? Actually, I want to uh, discuss this pterygopalatine fossa because the next class while we actually uh, discuss the maxillary artery and the maxillary nerve, then it will be very easy because the branches of the third part of maxillary artery and the branches of the maxillary nerve pass through these fossa with the same names. Okay, spinopalatine fossa, spinopalatine nerve, greater palatine foramen, greater palatine uh, vessels and nerves, pterygoid canal, artery of pterygoid canal. Infraorbital uh, fissure, inferior orbital fissure, infraorbital vessels and nerves. 
So most of the branches will be very easy if you are familiar with the pterygopalatine fossa and its uh, communications. The main content as you are able to see the uh, maxillary nerve through the foramen rotundum it is entering. So the trunk of the maxillary nerve which is giving branches and the pterygopalatine ganglion which is situated here with its uh, uh, connections and roots okay you will be able to see the pterygopalatine ganglion and also the third part of maxillary artery will be seen inside this pterygopalatine fossa which will give branches corresponding to the names of these communications which we have seen earlier okay so the contents are mainly pterygopalatine ganglion then the mandibular nerve and branches of the third part of maxillary artery so thank you very much for your patient listening we will meet again in one more class